Hey guys, it's Greg, creator of the Leptos web framework for Rust. I haven't made a YouTube video in a long time, but I wanted to make a short one this week to show off something that we just released this week and that I've been working on for about a year in one way or another, but that people have been asking for for a few years, which is finally shipping WASM, binary splitting, and lazy loading. So if you don't know what that means, uh, a quick review, when you create a web application with Leptos or another framework that compiles from Rust to WebAssembly, that creates a server binary, and then it also creates a WebAssembly binary that can run in the browser. And so you'll see, for example, on this basic page, right, uh, I have interactivity in the browser without going back to the server for anything, and that's because we've loaded this WebAssembly binary that hydrates the page, that makes it interactive. Uh, and this is great. It's a wonderful way to create interactive web applications with Rust. However, there is a problem. The problem is that unlike JavaScript applications, we traditionally haven't had a way to split that WebAssembly binary into smaller chunks. So this initial binary will grow and grow and grow in terms of its size as the application gets larger and larger. Now, because of the binary format, one kilobyte of WebAssembly is much cheaper for the browser to uh, parse and evaluate than one kilobyte of JavaScript. But there's still a problem that this is going to grow and grow over time as the application gets larger. So for example, this is just our, our basic starter application. It was 291 kilobytes, right? If I just add in a second page that's gonna load some data, that I've ready to find here and we compile it again, we'll see how it grows. And why is the binary size a problem? Well, when you load the page before anything becomes interactive, that main WebAssembly bundle has to load. And so as that increases, the initial time to interactive on the page becomes longer and longer, which isn't great for user experience. And particularly for larger applications, the entire binary has to be loaded before any single page can be hydrated. So we've recompiled with our second page now, and it goes from 291 up to 429. And that's just adding another route with some data loading. So we wanna find some way to split that apart. And that's exactly what we can do by binary splitting and lazy loading code. So I'm gonna open up the application again, and we'll look at this second page. This is a pretty simple page. It creates one resource to load some data, shows a header, has a suspense to just show the, the data in its debug form. And if we go to this server function, I'm going to add in one of the new things we have here, which is the lazy macro. When you use that lazy macro, along with cargo lepto serve dash dash split instead of not split, it's going to split the binary into multiple smaller binaries, depending on where you use these lazy annotations. So let's go back here and we'll load here. And now I'm actually going to start throttling the network connection so you can see what happens when we navigate. The first thing you'll notice is that the binary size has gone back down again a bit to 413 kilobytes. The second thing you'll notice is there's another JavaScript file that says wasm split. We'll get to that. And now when I navigate to another page, like the second page, it's actually going to load an additional WebAssembly bundle, these 27 kilobytes that tell us how to call that server function. And you'll see first it loads that bundle, and then it actually calls the server function. So what's happened here is essentially that it's taken an async function and it's just added an extra bit of asynchronicity, if you will. Rather than immediately calling the function, it first lazy loads the WebAssembly binary that's needed to call that function and then calls the function. And this is pretty basic, but there's actually much more that we can do here. Um, for example, you notice when we navigate from this first page to the second page, well, it lazy loads the data but it doesn't lazy load the view that we show for this page. But we actually can do that too. And to lazy load the view for a new route, we don't just use the lazy macro. We're actually going to use a slightly different uh, new construct that's called a lazy route. So for the view here, instead of the traditional sort of view equals some function, some component, we're gonna give it view equals lazy, and we'll say second page route new. Lazy is a new struct in Leptos router, and we'll have to define this second page route. This doesn't exist yet. So a lazy route is essentially just the implementation of a trait called lazy route for some 
struct. And this has two methods, data and view. Now we're going to annotate this with the lazy route macro two, which will actually lazy load this view. And that means we can take out this impl future because it will make it a future automatically and just have any view. Uh, and so for now, the data method is going to return self. We're just going to have that be a tuple struct for now. And the view is going to return the view. And we can just take this whole component right out of second page and paste it in. You notice it returns into uh, it returns an any view by calling into any. And it does this because when we lazy load our routes, they need to be concrete types. They can't have impl into view in the return type here uh, when we're doing the lazy loading, just the way the code splitting works. So now if I compile this again, when we load it in the browser, we should see a different behavior. If I go back to the main page, now when I click on second page, it starts loading another split WebAssembly binary called second page route view and then a bunch of unique IDs. And it also loads second page data. And you'll notice this is second page data. This is second page view. And then you'll notice it actually loads a third chunk now we've only had two explicitly lazy things. We've only had the lazy server function and the lazy route, which makes the view lazy, but it's created a third binary because it splits out shared code between them and then lazy loads that so that you're not double loading that code as well. And that's pretty significant. In this case, it's 33 kilobytes. But we can do even better than this because there's a problem you might notice. We call the view and then we start loading the data, and then we call the server function. Now we've loaded part of the lazy loaded code for the data function, for the server function, uh, up front when we, because of the code that it shares with the view. But we load the view, and then we load the data, and then we call the function. And this makes sense, right? If we think of this as a lazy loaded view, calling this function is going to be lazy. We load this from the server. So when we navigate to the page, we load the view from the server, and then we create this resource, which calls second page data, and that's lazy as well. So then we go back to the server to load second page data, and then once we've finally done that, we actually call the function second page data on the server. So we've got three separate back and forths here. So can we do this better? And of course we can. And the way that we do that is by using this data method that we have not used yet in the second page route definition. So right now we just return second page route, but here's how this is actually supposed to work. You see this data resource? Here's the type, I'm just gonna copy and paste that. And now we're going to move the creation of this resource up into the data method. And then we can just destructure down here. So we can say, let second page route data equals this. That's a really simple change, but when we compile again, you'll see that it causes the page to behave quite differently. So now when we go to back to this main page and we load it and we click second page, let's clear this out first so we can see. When we click second page, it loads the data function and the route view function in parallel and then it immediately calls out to the server to get the actual data. And the reason that it's able to do this is because of the way that we structured the lazy route trait. So essentially, on navigation, when we go from the home page to the second page, when we use this lazy route like this, it's going to concurrently call the data function, which creates a resource, which starts loading second page data. And at the same time that it's calling the data function, it's going to start lazy loading the view. Now, second page data is also lazy, so that means that when we call the data function, it immediately begins lazy loading second page data and lazy loading our view. This means that these two can run concurrently, and then we can call the data here. Now, this was, what was this, 400 milliseconds or so with the fast 3G throttling, 4G throttling. I'm wondering if we can make it a little faster by actually doing something slightly different. 
and that is removing the lazy annotation here on the server function. And I'll explain to you why that is. So we want to be able to start loading the data itself concurrently with loading the view in order to show the page immediately as soon as the view is loaded and as soon as the data is loaded. When we lazy load the second page data function, we have an extra step. We have to go to the server to get the additional WASM binary for the second page data before we call out again. But we can do something uh, a little clever here. And if we just take off the lazy annotation and we rebuild, which has happened, and I go back here, when we go to the second page, you'll notice it will immediately call the second page data uh, endpoint to get some data. And while it's loads at the same time that it's loading the lazy loaded view. And so now rather than lazy loading the server function and lazy loading the view concurrently, we're actually calling the server function and lazy loading the view concurrently. And if you notice how closely these overlap, first of all, we had 400 milliseconds before because we had 200 milliseconds where we were lazy, lazy loading the server function and then 200 milliseconds of calling the server function. Now our navigation time is just about 200 milliseconds. So actually by making that server function not lazy, we have made the load time when we navigate to the next page faster. And you'll also notice we're really not paying almost any cost for the lazy loading of the view here because in order to navigate to this page, we have to load the data anyway. So we're really only spending in this particular case, well, an extra 25 milliseconds waiting for the view to load. That's really not too bad. So the, the idea of concurrently loading the data and the view here is that you essentially pay for the cost of lazy loading the view because you have to load the data anyway in order to navigate. Now there is a caveat here. You'll notice if we refresh this page, the main bundle without the um, lazy loaded server function is 422. If we put this back in, let's see what the main bundle is when we are lazy loading the server function. Four twenty two. Now it's down to four hundred, and this should make sense, right? Essentially, when we took away the lazy loading of the server function, it meant that our subsequent navigation was faster because we didn't have to lazy load the server function in order to call the the uh, actually call the server function. But when we don't lazy load the server function, it means we have to load that initially. So these are all trade offs, and that's why we do things like the manual macros here rather than trying to guess. It gives you the control over where you want to split out different parts of your view. If you have a very expensive uh, view that's very large or that includes lots of complex logic in it and you want to lazy load that, you can do that for just one route and leave the rest of it in your main bundle. If you have a server function that you know is going to take a long time to run and you just want to lazy load the WebAssembly binary because it's not that much relative to the cost of the actual API call, you know, you can make that decision. But these are all trade-offs that you can actually make. And we just give you the power with these two very simple concepts with the lazy macro, which you can use not only on a server function, but on any function in order to split it out. And then with this lazy route concept with the data and the view split from one another. So if you want to get started with this, it's really simple. I mean, what I would say would be to take pages like this second page route which right previously it was a component that looked like this. It had let data equals some resource. Take some components that are a whole page that look like this and restructure them. Pull out the resources into a data method. Keep the view in the view method. Implement this lazy route trait, splitting up those two and see where it takes you. I'm sure there will be bugs with the implementation here. I'm sure that things aren't perfect, but I've been really excited to work on it and release it. And it's available now in the latest versions of Cargo Leptos. Uh, there, the, this, this is running the latest versions on Git. By the time you're watching this, I may well have released new patch releases. Uh, the changes were a few bug fixes in the splitting and the ability to use this lazy on server functions, not just regular functions. But most likely by the time you're watching this video, those will already have been released. So I hope you enjoy and feel free to come ask questions in Discord or on GitHub and certainly open issues with any bugs that you find. Thanks so much, and I hope you're having a great day.